Welcome to session eight of Let God Be Glorified, A Call to Spiritual Maturity for Mothers-in-Law and Daughters-in-Law. This is our last session together, and I want to thank you for this time because I know that time is a precious commodity, and I'm really appreciative that you have chosen to spend this time with me in God's Word. And I also will continue to pray for you that the Spirit is going to reveal spiritual truths to you so that you will persevere in your pursuit of relationship with your mother-in-law and daughter-in-law, but more importantly, that you will pursue a relationship with Jesus. When we left Ruth last week, she was in a foreign country living among a people who would have viewed Moabites with suspicion and even contempt. She was the sole support of her mother-in-law and how easily she could have given up hope. Instead, she went out to find a field where she would be able to glean. And as she bent over in this back-breaking work of gathering grain, little did she know that Boaz, her kinsman redeemer, was watching her. From now on, every act is going to revolve around Boaz, who's not only her kinsman redeemer, but is also soon going to become her bridegroom. And in the, the same respect, as we continue looking at these 10 principles of a loving relationship between a mother-in-law and daughter-in-law, each of our acts of love, each of our acts of kindness is also going to center around Jesus who is our Redeemer and also our Bridegroom. As a matter of fact, in the book of Ruth, references to redeem, Redeemer, Redemption occurs 23 times. And Ruth is a very short book. It only has 85 verses. So when you hear Redeem or Redemption today, let your ears perk up and pay attention to how it's used. Today, we pick up with principle six in the loving relationship. And principle six is that people will take note when you love your mother-in-law or your daughter-in-law. Boaz came to the fields and he saw this young woman that he had not seen before and he asked the foreman who she was. And he identified her as the Moabitess who had returned with Naomi. And he also condemned her hard work. He said, she's been here since early morning. She's been working steadily. She's taken only one small break. So Boaz calls Ruth over and he says, I want you to remain in my fields with my servant girls. And you don't have to worry because I told my young men to leave you alone, not to touch you. And if you get thirsty, go over and drink from my water jugs. And Ruth was just overcome. She fell to her knees and she asked him, why have you taken note of me? I'm a foreigner. I'm less than one of your servant girls. And Boaz is very forthright in his commendation. Look with me at what he says in chapter 2, verse 11. Boaz replied, I've been told all about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband. How you left your father and mother in your homeland and came to live with the people you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Obviously, People are talking about Ruth and Naomi because Boaz is very familiar with their story. More than that, Boaz is impressed. And he bestows on Ruth this blessing of reward and refuge. He asks God to richly reward her and also to provide protection, refuge under his wings. Now, Boaz is more than just a man of words. Boaz is also a man of action. His name means in him strength. And Boaz is going to use all of his strength 
his vast wealth, his power, and he is immediately going to begin rewarding Ruth himself. At noontime, he tells her to come on over and to join the rest of his workers to dip her bread in the vinegar that's been provided. And he also gives her roasted grain to eat. Now in the Bible, grain and harvest almost always symbolizes blessing. And Boaz gives her enough roasted grain that it not only sates her appetite, she's completely full, but she has enough to take home and share the leftovers with her mother-in-law that evening. Then when the workers return to the fields, Boaz says to his young men, now I want you to pull out some of the stalks from the bundles and purposely leave them behind so that she can pick them up. And if she happens to go to a portion of the field that's not yet been harvested, don't rebuke her. Leave her alone. Let her gather wherever she wants to and take home as much as she will. So that that evening, Ruth takes home enough food for two women to live on for five days. So many people took note. The townspeople took note and they were all talking about Ruth and Naomi. The foreman took note. He was paying attention to how hard she was working for her mother-in-law. But the most important one who took note is Boaz. Because Boaz has the resources. He has the power and the strength to be able to reward Ruth. And in our relationships, people will take note. Our families are going to take note. And just think of how contented they're going to feel because the two most important women in their lives truly love one another. And our, our friends and our families are going to take note. Hopefully unbelievers take note and they want to know from where or from whom such devotion comes. But the most important one who will take note will be our Redeemer, Jesus. Because he has resources that we cannot even imagine to reward us with. And the part of this section that I like the best is when Boaz says, don't rebuke her. Let her go and gather as much as she wants to because we don't have to be shy or hesitant when Jesus showers us with those blessings. We can feast until we're full and then share the leftovers with our mothers-in-law and daughters-in-law. The seventh principle of a loving relationship is that a woman seeks and heeds the advice of a mother-in-law and the daughter-in-law she loves. Ruth comes home that evening and she has all this grain and Naomi says, where have you been? And Ruth says, well, I've been in the field of Boaz. And Naomi simply has knowledge that Ruth does not have. Because Naomi has lived in Bethlehem and she knows who Boaz is. She also knows that as a kinsman redeemer, what Boaz can do for them. Because a kinsman redeemer has four responsibilities and two of these are very important to our story. First of all, a kinsman redeemer fulfills the obligation of a lever of marriage. He also redeems or retains land of a deceased relative if that land comes up for public sale. He also redeems or buys back a relative who has entered into voluntary servitude, probably to pay off the debt. And then he also avenges the murder of a relative if the murder is found outside the city of refuge. So Naomi simply has a knowledge base that Ruth does not have. Now, I want you to think back very quickly to our third session and that list of 10 things that a daughter-in-law would never tell her mother-in-law, but she wishes that she knew. And right on top of that list was, don't give us any advice about how to raise your children. 
We will go to our pediatrician, to our friends, to one another, but I just don't want any advice from you. Which doesn't really make sense because after all, this woman raised a son that you happened to think was so wonderful that you chose to marry him. I can very quickly gauge the health of a relationship between a mother-in-law and daughter-in-law based upon the freedom with which they seek and accept advice from one another. Because a daughter-in-law, mother-in-law who truly love one another, it's just natural. It just happens. One day my daughter-in-law called me and I could tell that she was a little upset. She said that her youngest daughter, who was two years old at the time, was holding her breath until she literally cast out, and she wanted to know if this child were doing it purposefully. And I said, I honestly didn't know. But I knew that she had a yearly checkup coming up, and I suggested that she just ask her pediatrician. Well, I waited until after the visit and called. I wanted to know what the pediatrician had said, and I could hear almost the near panic in my daughter's-in-law voice. She said, the pediatrician told me that yes, she was doing this purposely, that she's a strong-willed child, that you will be fighting with her for your entire life, and you are going to be lucky if you can get a husband for this girl. And I started chuckling, and then she started chuckling, and I said, so what did you say? And my daughter-in-law said, I informed her that I did not have time for a strong-willed child because I had to raise my other daughter, Natalie, who was even more strong-willed. And of course, we were roaring by that time. I apologized <laughs> because it does seem that strong-willed granddaughters run in our family. And I really wanted to blame my husband's side of the family for this genetic flaw but it was my grandmother who had said, there's no such thing as stubbornness, only independence. But I was also able to assure her that I adored my grandmother, that she was a strong believer. She was the one who was responsible for my father coming to the Lord. And during the Depression, after her husband died, she raised six children all by herself. You see, what is stubbornness is like the bitterness of an unripe fruit. And God can take this, and he can ripen it, he can mature it, until it becomes this tremendous perseverance in the faith and strength. Now, in this particular instance, I didn't have any good advice. I didn't know. But because it was just natural for us to seek advice from one another, I had this opportunity to uh, laugh with her, and to encourage her. Daughters-in-law, however, are not the only ones to accept advice. Mothers-in-law are also to accept advice. And sometimes older women tend to think, what can a younger woman teach me? Well, as a mother-in-law myself, let me tell you other mothers-in-law, when we get too old to accept advice from a younger woman, we have simply become too old. Let's look at what Paul said to Timothy. In 1 Timothy 4.12, Paul says, No one should despise your youth. Instead, you should be an example to the believers, and there's no age limit given for these believers, but be a, an example to the believers in speech, conduct, in love, and faith, and in purity. So when we're willing to accept advice from younger women, we stay young ourselves because they have a, a fresh perspective. And not only that, but as, as we just rejoice in their godly conduct and in their faith, we are so encouraged because we know that our future generations are in good hands. But when Ruth was seeking advice, because it wasn't just that she had gleaned in Boaz's fields, but Boaz had said, stay 
in my fields. So she needed discernment as well as just a knowledge base because Boaz could be a very kind, close relative, or he could be a man with ulterior motives. So she needed to know from Naomi, can we trust this man? Is he a man of good character? So let's look at what Naomi says about Boaz. In chapter 2, verse 20, The Lord bless him, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law. He has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. She added, that man is a close relative. He is one of her kinsmen redeemers. This is the second time that we see the word his seed, faithful love, used in the book of Ruth. He has not stopped showing his kindness, his, his, his seed, to the living and the dead. Now in this context, this is talking very specifically about a familial love and commitment to in-laws. We think so much about Ruth and Naomi being in-laws that we forget that Boaz is also an in-law. His blood relatives are dead. Elimelech, Machlon, Kilion, they're all dead. Ruth and Naomi are simply the widows, the in-laws. But his faithful love extends past that bloodline to the in-laws and also past death. Consider this example. There were two nephews who had a beloved older uncle. And they often took their families to visit this uncle and his wife. Well, the uncle died. And the wife called one of the nephews and she said, I'd love to have a visit from you. Bring your family down. And he said, why would I come down and visit you now? My uncle's dead. Now, his brother, the other nephew, within a week, also calls. And he said, would it be convenient for me to bring my family down to visit? And by the way, could I pack any tools? Is there anything that I could do around the house for you? And don't worry about cooking anything. My wife wants to fix some of your favorite foods and bring down for now, which one demonstrated a seed? Faithful love. So Naomi was able to discern Boaz's character. And she told Ruth to remain in his fields close to his servant girls because she said, I'm afraid if you go to another field, you might be harmed. And Ruth stays in those fields, not only through the barley harvest, but also through the wheat harvest. Which brings us to our next principle, the eighth principle in the loving relationship. And that is, a woman seeks rest for the mother-in-law and daughter-in-law that she loves. After Naomi's sage advice about the fields, we might be a bit surprised by this next advice. Because one day Naomi tells Ruth, I want you to bathe and to put on your best clothes, get all gussied up, go to the threshing floor where Boaz is going to be winnowing the barley, but don't let him see you. Wait until he goes to sleep, uncover his feet, and lie down at his feet. And you might be thinking, that's a rather bold and outrageous plan, which it is, unless you understand her motivation. Turn with me to chapter 3, verse 1. One day, Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, should I not try to find a home for you, where you will be well provided for? Now, the Hebrew word for home is Noah, and it literally means rest. As a matter of fact, go back to verse or chapter 1 and verse 9, and as she's trying to send her daughters-in-law back to her mother's home, she says, May the Lord grant that each of you find rest in the home of another husband. Now, in this context, it's not talking about rest from work, because all of us know that being a wife is hard work. Running a household is hard work. It's talking about rest from worry. With a worthy husband, 
Ruth isn't going to have to go out and glean in those fields because she's worried that if she doesn't, she will literally starve to death because her husband will provide for her. And she doesn't have to worry about being harmed in any of those fields because her husband, a worthy husband, is going to protect her. And she doesn't have to worry about making all of these decisions by herself because a worthy husband is going to give her godly counsel. Naomi wanted to find rest for Ruth. And that rest is in the home of a worthy bridegroom. Now, we should be wanting to find rest for our mothers-in-laws and daughters-in-laws in the home of our bridegroom, Jesus. Abiding in him, leaning on his strength, letting him guide us, just resting in his inexplicable peace. And part of that rest is also helping that woman to develop an intimacy, a relationship with her bridegroom. So that whenever you extend those acts of kindness, those acts of love, you're acting in behalf of the bridegroom, in behalf of Jesus. So when there is a, a young mother who's worried because her husband's going off on a business trip, and she has these young children that she has to look after, that mother-in-law comes and she stays with her and she helps out. And she is providing Jesus' strength and protection in those situations. And if either one happens to go into the hospital and they need someone to stay with them when they come home, then you can be the hands of the great physician as he's healing. And if there is a mother-in-law who has lost her husband and she has not slept alone in a house for 50 years, then you can show Jesus' faithful love by staying with her, or perhaps even for a week or two to return her son to her, to let him be there to comfort her. And you also try to help her develop an intimacy with Jesus. My daughter-in-law told me one time that the only way that she could find time throughout the day to study her Bible and to pray was to lock herself into the bathroom. That was the only place in the house that the kids would not bug her. And unfortunately, I lived 2,000 miles away at the time because I would have loved to have the opportunity to just go over and watch the children for an hour a day so that she could study her Bible and pray. And of course, as we're praying for her, we are praying for her spiritual maturity, that she grows in the Lord, that she learn discernment so that she knows what truly matters, that she is, is rooted and grounded in Jesus' love. And of course, any time that there's any spiritual warfare, we also pour out our hearts in her behalf. So we seek rest for the daughter-in-law and mother-in-law that we love. Our ninth principle is that our love for our daughter-in-law and mother-in-law will reveal our character, the noble character of a worthy bride. Now think back over the story. And think about the way that God has used Ruth and Naomi's love for one another to bring them to Boaz, the kinsman redeemer. Naomi tried to send Ruth back to her mother's home to find rest in the home of a husband in Moab. But God uses Ruth's love for Naomi to reject that so that she goes to live among God's people where she is going to find a much better rest with a much better husband. And now he is going to use Naomi's love for Ruth to jolt poor Boaz from one role into another role. 
because from the very beginning, Boaz has um, acted as protector for Ruth. Remember the first time that he sees her? He says, may the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Well, wing is a symbol of protection. And immediately, Boaz protects Ruth. He uh, provides food, so he's protecting her from starvation. And he also is protecting her from the young men. He makes sure you leave her alone. Okay, but now, let's go back to Boaz is sleeping, and here Ruth is at his feet, and the poor man wakes up in the middle of the night, and surprise, there's this woman at his feet. And he goes, who are you? And let's look at, Luke, at Ruth's response. She says in chapter 3, verse 9, I am your servant Ruth. Spread the corner of your garment over me, since you are a kinsman redeemer. Now the corner of the garment here literally means wing. And Boaz is going to recognize that she is proposing a leveret marriage. Because when a Jewish husband marries his bride, he puts the corner or the wing of his talent or the corner of his prayer shawl around his bride to show that she is now under his protection. God has such a wonderful sense of humor. He is going to answer Boaz's prayer for refuge under God's wing by saying, you're the wing, Boaz. It's through your marriage that I'm going to provide that refuge. Now, Boaz accepts this proposal of a leveret marriage, but he could have done so begrudgingly. He could have done it simply out of a sense of obligation, but that's not what happens. Instead, Boaz embraces this proposal. Let's look at what he says in verse 10. The Lord bless you, my daughter, he replied. This kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. You have not run after the younger men, whether rich or poor, and now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you all you ask. All my fellow townsmen know that you are a woman of noble character. This is incredible praise. Remember who Ruth is. Throughout this story, she is referred to as the Moabitess, as often as she is referred to by her name, Ruth. She's this foreigner. She's poor. She um, used to worship idols. She has been under this constant public scrutiny. And her love for her mother-in-law has revealed this woman of noble character. So for the third and the last time in the book of Ruth, we see the use of the word seed. Boaz says, this kindness, this seed, is greater than that which you showed earlier. In context, this seed this faithful love is the ability to present ourselves as worthy brides of Christ. In this Bible study, as much emphasis has been put on spiritual maturity as on the relationship. Because as important as this relationship is, it is secondary to the relationship that we have with Christ. So that we give this relationship to God so that he can then use it, so that he can sanctify us, so that we become these capable women of noble character, so that we can be that worthy bride of Christ. And that brings us to our last principle in a loving relationship. And that is that the love between a mother-in-law and daughter-in-law glorifies the bridegroom. 
As soon as Boaz accepts this proposal of a levirate marriage, he immediately begins to act as a worthy husband. First of all, he protects her. He tells her to stay there for the rest of the night because it would have been dangerous in those days, just as it would be today, for a woman to walk home alone at night. And the next morning, he tells his men, don't tell anyone that there was a woman here on the threshing floor because he was protecting Ruth's reputation. Mm -hmm. He also acts very quickly to ensure her future because there was one problem with Naomi's plan. And this problem is that there is another kinsman redeemer who is a closer relative. So Boaz is going to have to figure out how to deal with this closer relative. Now it's important that we understand right now exactly what a leveret marriage is. In a leveret marriage, a man marries the widow of a deceased relative in order to retain the family property and also to provide for the widow. In order to retain the family property, the man who enters into this levirate marriage does not inherit the land. That land goes to the son who will be produced as a result of this levirate marriage. So Boaz has to come up with a way to approach this close relative because the only one who is obligated for a leveret marriage is a brother-in-law. And neither Boaz nor this closer relative is a brother-in-law. So Boaz has to somehow make him obligated or to get him to release his rights so that Boaz is going to be able to marry her. So Boaz comes up with an ingenious plan. That very next morning, he goes to the city gates, and I hope by now that you recognize that business transactions happen at city gates. He gets 10 witnesses from those judges who are sitting there on those benches in the city gates. And as soon as his closer relative comes, he says, you need to know this. Naomi is getting ready to put some of Elimelech's land up for public sale. Do you want to buy the land? And if you don't, I will. And the man said, I want to buy the land. So then Boaz replies in a way that he's basically saying, okay, if you're going to act as a kinsman redeemer by redeeming the land, you also have to take on the responsibilities of the kinsman redeemer by redeeming Ruth, his widow. Look at what Boaz says. Chapter 4, verse 5. And Boaz said, On the day that you buy the land from Naomi and from Ruth, the Moabitess, you acquired the dead man's widow in order to maintain the name of the dead with his property. At this the kinsman redeemer said, then I cannot redeem it, because I might endanger my own estate. You redeem it yourself, I cannot do it, because see, he would spend all of his own money, his wealth, to buy this land, but it wouldn't be his. It would be the child's. So a true kinsman redeemer is the one who has the means, the wealth to buy the property, to redeem it but also the one who's willing to make the sacrifice in order to do so. And, and praise God, that's how we glorify our bridegroom. Because Jesus, our bridegroom, is the only one who has the means to redeem us. He's God, he took on the form of humanity, lived a sinless life so that he would be the perfect sacrifice, the only sacrifice for our sins. And also he's glorified because he was willing to do it. He was willing to die for us. Now from the moment that this marriage is settled, we are going to see that everything that happens, all these wonderful things that will now happen to Ruth and Naomi, glorify the bridegroom, who's also the kinsman redeemer. First of all, 
the elders, these judges, are going to bestow on them this blessing of fruitfulness. Look at verse 11. Then the elders and all those at the gate said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you have standing in Ephrata and be famous in Bethlehem. Through the offspring the Lord gives you by this young woman, may your family be like that of Perez and Tamar, to whom, or to Judah, sorry. Here we see that through the bridegroom, Ruth is going to become fruitful, that she is going to build up the house of Israel, that she is going to, as a worthy bride, help her husband become famous throughout the land, have standing, and also that she's going to raise godly offspring. And our Redeemer is glorified because it is only through Him that we too can become fruitful. So that we can build up His house, build up the kingdom of God. That as worthy brides of Christ and also to our husbands, that we are going to help them become men of God. And we are going to raise godly offspring. We glorify Jesus when we are productive and fruitful. However, the bridegroom is also glorified because he's the one who restores Naomi's family. God takes away Ruth's disgrace, and she has a child, a son. They name him Obed. And the women take this child to Naomi, and they say, Naomi now has a son because Obed is legally Naomi's son, not just a grandson, but since he inherits her husband's property, he is the legal heir, the legal son. But he's much more than that. Look at what else the women say in verse 14 of chapter 4. Praise be to the Lord who this day has not left you without a kinsman redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Here's what Obed is to Naomi. First of all, he now becomes her kinsman redeemer. If Boaz dies tomorrow, she doesn't have to worry. Obed will take care of her. And he will become famous in Israel. Her husband's Abimelech selfishness will be forgotten. It's through Obed that her descendants will now be known. And he is going to renew her life and sustain her in old age. You know, our, our grandchildren re-engage us in life. When I was teaching this the last time, one of the ladies came in and she was just worn out. And we asked her why she was worn out. She had been up late because she had been watching her granddaughter play volleyball in a volleyball tournament. You see, without the granddaughter, she might have been sitting in front of the TV. But because of that granddaughter, she's re-engaged in life. How they sustain us. But look, for your daughter-in-law who loves you and is better to you than seven sons has given him birth. Our relationship with the grandchildren is going to be very dependent upon the relationship that we have with the mothers. And praise God, this also says that there is a possible depth of relationship that I think we're only beginning to get a glimpse of. Because Ruth loved Naomi and was better to her than seven sons. We can almost have a better relationship. We probably can have a better relationship with our daughters in law than our sons because there's this bond of nurturing between them. And then we unite, not just as daughter in law but, and mother in law, but as sisters in Christ. And we are just grounded in His love. The depth of relationship is absolutely enviable. Now, you may have thought that the ending to this book is uh, a letdown. It's such a beautiful story. And now they go into this 10-generation list. What's with that? 
Well, it happens to be very significant because in the 10 generation list, the first place, the seventh place, and the 10th place are particularly significant. Now, David is the last one mentioned. He's in the 10th place. And that makes sense because then all the focus is on him. Everything in the generational list is leading up to David. And of course, David is the most important king in Israel. The first position is held by Perez, which is unusual because Perez's father, Judah, is the one um, by whom the clan is called. So why not start with Judah? Well, there are a couple of reasons. One actually helps to legitimize David's claim to the throne. Because Deuteronomy says that no illegitimate child or his descendants until the 10th generation can lead the nation of Israel. So this ensures that everyone knows that there have been 10 generations since Perez. But there are also some very close parallels between Perez and Obed, because both were born of Gentile mothers, and both were associated with elaborate marriages. However, Perez's birth was an example of a failed levered marriage, one that certainly did not even come close to God's intent. Because the first husband that Tamar had in a levered marriage was not willing to risk that inheritance. He did not want to produce children. And so consequently, God killed him. And then her father-in-law says, well, just wait for a few years for my next son, and then you can marry him, but that was deception. He never intended to give this third son to Tamar. So Tamar resorts to sexual sin in order to have parents. Contrast that to Obed. Here we have a levered marriage that reflects God's intent. We have a worthy husband, not like the sons of Judah. We have a worthy bride of good character. We have a mother-in-law who loved her so much that she's going to make sure that she finds rest for this daughter-in-law. And we have the God of Israel who has a tremendous plan for these women. But interestingly, both Ruth and Tamar are listed in the genealogies of Christ, of Jesus. Isn't it absolutely amazing? All of the families that we see in the earthly lineage of Jesus. We have Adam and Eve. Throughout this study, we've looked at Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Rebecca and David and, and his wives and his family. But the one family that points directly to Jesus is the one that hinges on the love between the mother-in-law and daughter-in-law. Because the man who is going to hold the seventh place in this genealogy is Boaz. And seven is the number of perfection and completion. Boaz is the kinsman redeemer who points us to our redeemer, and he is Perfect. He is the perfect Lamb of God, and He completed our redemption. We have looked at so many principles as we've gone through this. But I want you to leave, I want to leave you with this final principle. And it's really the only one that you need. It's in Ephesians. It's our Redeemer lives. And He is joining us together to become a dwelling place of God. When these women brought Obed into Naomi, they said, 
Praise God who has not left you without a family redeemer. And praise God he has not left us without a family redeemer. Because our redeemer lives. And he is joining mothers-in-law and daughters-in-law together to be a dwelling place for God. Therefore, as it says in 1 Corinthians, we will glorify God both in our bodies, in our actions, those acts of kindness, those acts of loves, love, but also in our spirits, in our hearts. We're not doing this out of a sense of obligation. We are doing this joyfully. So we glorify God in our bodies and in our spirits, which are his. Sisters, let God be glorified. Let's go to prayer. Dear God, we praise you and we glorify you today because you knew before you ever created us that we would need a redeemer. And you planned before the creation of earth, that your son would be the perfect sacrifice for us. And so, Lord, we glorify the bridegroom. We glorify Christ because he has loved us, he has redeemed us, and not only that, but he has made us his bride so that he is sanctifying us. And, Lord, we want to honor you in all of our actions. We want to glorify you with both our bodies and our spirits. And Lord, we glorify you because we are yours. And so we pray as brides of Christ in his name.